Romans chapter 6. We're going to talk about baptism this morning and uh, what, what is it? What is baptism? Um, one of the wonderful controversial subjects, uh, something debated for thousands of years now amongst uh, churches and different kinds of churches, and one of the things that kind of sorts out, you know, a church has a name over the door, well, what kind of a church is it? Well, you can, you can tell a lot by that name because of the way that they practice, teach, believe in baptism. You know, there, there are a large number of Christians today, and by the way, this is unbelievably concerning, that don't think baptism, water baptism is important, uh, and have not been baptized and could care less about it and are basically taught this by some of the churches that they go to. And I, I, just, I just have to tell you, that's a, that's a dangerous thing. Um, it is a disobedient thing. And, um, and so this, is, this would be considered a doctrinal uh, type message, but I promise you, you'll get a blessing from it this morning. We're going we're gonna to read Romans 6 in just a minute, but first let's do some definitions. Uh, baptism is, a, is an important thing in the life of a believer. Uh, it's a special thing. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of you probably in the front of your Bible or your mama's Bible, you have written the day that you were baptized. And uh, sometimes, by the way, if you want one, we can give you one. Uh, have a little certificate from the church that says that you were baptized on this particular day at a church. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, a landmark kind of, a, of an event. And so... So let's define it. Baptism. Here's the definition. It comes from the Greek word baptisma, or there's other babzo, babzo, baptizo, depending on how you conjugate the word. Literally, the word means to dip or to immerse. Okay? It does not mean sprinkle. There is no word that's even associated with sprinkle that could even be accidentally confused with baptism in Greek. It is in a completely, totally different word, okay? So, just by definition, baptizo, or that Greek word, means to dip. Now, how many of you got on a pair of boots this morning? How many of you got a pair of boots made of cowhide this morning? Okay. What color is cowhide? Depends on what it's tanned with. But if you don't tan it, you can kind of see through it, sort of. It's a little bit too thick for that. But if you stretch it enough, you can almost see through it. It's, it's a yellowish kind of a color, right? But the neat thing about cowhide is, is that you can tan it. And if you tan it, then you can dye it. And it will, you can turn any color you want to. So um, if you look at Mrs. Williams' boots, she has some pink tops on those. I, uh, I happen to have blue tops on mine. Both of these are cowhide, okay? How do we change their color? We baptized that hide. That's where the word comes from. In the leather tanning business, they would take a hide, they would dip it, immerse it completely into the dye, pull it out, allow it to dry, and it changes the color of the dye, okay? Now, if I were to say that I have some some cowhide that I had baptized, and you were to look at it, and it were to be this pinkish colored, tan colored leather with these spots and drips and runs all over it, you see, that wouldn't have been baptized. That would have been sprinkled, like this new art, you know, where they take a paintbrush and hang up the, and they, they do like that, right? I, I want you to understand and to see that image because that's what the word means. Now, here's one of the interesting things about the word baptize is that it is a transliterated word, okay? It is a transliterated word rather than a translated word. So, when we bring one word from one language into another, most of the time we translate it. For instance, in Spanish, an hombre is a man, Man does not sound anything at all like hombre, does it? But when we go to a rodeo, we transliterated, transliterated that word. We took rodeo straight out of Spanish, 
stuck it straight into English and didn't change it at all, okay? So a translated word is if we had, if I, I wasn't part of it, if the translators had translated baptism, you would know of a fella named John the Dipper. John the Dunker or John the Immerser. Okay? Because that's how you would translate that word from Greek into English. No one debates this. Okay? This is, this is not up for debate. It doesn't matter what background somebody comes from. They're going to agree with this. You can't disagree with this. This is truth. That word was transliterated and it was brought from the Greek language straight into the English language so that we have this religious word now that's baptism. But it was not a religious word in their day. Just like last week we talked about the word ekklesia, that it was not a religious word. But you see, ekklesia is a translated word, isn't it? We take ekklesia from Greek and we translate it to what? Church. Right? Doesn't sound anything at all like it. Totally different. But baptism is a transliterated word. All right. So we, we pulled out from one to the other. Now, here's what I submit to you. We do not have the right to define a word however we want to. A word means what it means. Now, I know you live in the postmodern world where, you know, words don't have meaning anymore. And you can make, you know, you can identify as, you know, I identify as somebody who is, is purple. But, but uh, all of that's foolishness. And I think you understand that. All right. So let's look at the picture of baptism. It is a picture. This is why mode matters. And what do you mean by mode, preacher? I mean by water baptism, what I mean is, is the mode is, is that you need to go all the way under the water. And here's why it matters. Because, because, because it is a picture of something that takes place in your heart. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning in just a minute. If I take that hide and I dip it in that vat, it goes in tan colored, yellow colored, and it comes out let's say red, it is changed. The whole thing is completely changed and it's very evident that it has been changed, okay? So a person who trusts in Jesus Christ is changed forever. And baptism is a symbol of that change. So let's look at Romans chapter 6 and I want to talk with you about three things right quick. Romans 6, let's read through verse 10, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus Christ are baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Let's pray together. Father, as we read your word today, we pray that you'd help us understand it and apply it to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, giving us that understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing that I want you to see is, is these passages in Romans 6, and this is very important. This is talking about spiritual baptism, all right? This is not talking about water baptism. We'll get to water baptism in a minute, but we're talking about spiritual baptism right here. We're talking about something that happens in a life of a person when they trust in Christ that you can't see. Now, I wish, I, I wish God had turned us, you know, a different color when we get saved. It would make things so much easier. 
You know what I mean? I mean, you'd be like, that dude's saved, that girl's saved. You walk in the mall and you'd be like, nobody here is, you know, green or purple, whatever color you turn. You'd be looking around going, man, wait, this, this is a field that, that is ripe, right? Uh, you know, and if they would turn one color when they're almost ready to be saved, and anyway, I'm just teasing, but, but no, no, something happens inside of you, in your spirit. When you get saved, you are, you die. There is a death that occurs. You die to the old man. A new man is born in your life, and he calls this baptism. And so baptism pictures, water baptism is a symbol or a picture of something that happens in your life. And the first thing we see is it's a picture of identification with Christ. We are identifying with Him. So as part of what I said a minute ago, that when you trust in Christ, you are changed forever. forever. Look what he says there in the first verse. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, this is, this is something that I kind of tried to do when I was a little kid. When I got saved, I understood, hey, I, I'm not saved by my good deeds. I'm saved by God's grace. I'm saved by faith. Therefore, in my little mind, I can do whatever I want to do. And all I got to do is ask Jesus to forgive me and he'll forgive me. And so I tried that for a little while. Mama didn't agree with that very much. She'd whoop the fire out of me whenever I did stuff I wasn't supposed to do. And Daddy sure didn't agree with that. And the preacher, he always hollering, spitting and yelling about sin. And, and it took me a little while to figure out that getting saved is not a get out of hell free card so I can live however I want to live. That getting saved means that I completely changed, okay? So he says, God forbid, never accuse Paul of saying that you can go get saved and then live however you want to live because that's not true and he's never said it, okay? But there is an identification. Look there at verse, verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? This is what happens when you get saved, you die to sin. So it doesn't make sense for a Christian to go chasing after sin anymore. That is is th- those are two completely different, mutually exclusive things, okay? And he goes on to say, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So when you get saved, you die. Think about it like this. It's like you were transported back in time. When you get saved, when you call on the Lord Jesus Christ, you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me. Please save me. It's like he transports you back in time 2,000 years ago, puts you in Christ, nails you to the cross. When Jesus dies, you die. And then when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, you are resurrected from the dead. And he brings you back and sticks you back where you are today. That's like what happens when you get saved. Because you are so identified with the Lord Jesus Christ that you are now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. I've showed you this before, but it it bears repeating. Imagine that this piece of paper represents you and my Bible represents Jesus. When you get saved, God takes you and puts you in Christ So that now what is true of Christ is true of you. And so Jesus was nailed to the cross. You were nailed to the cross. Jesus died on the cross. You died to to sin and to that old man. Jesus is laid in the tomb. You're laid in the tomb. Jesus is raised from the dead. You are raised from the dead. Now to walk in a new life. Okay. This is the identification with Christ. Verse 4. Therefore we are buried with Christ him by baptism into death. Can you see how important the picture is? Every time someone is baptized, that water is symbolic of a tomb. It is symbolic of a death. And you take the person and they go down into the water and disappear underneath the water, just like a dead body is put into the ground and covered up with dirt. He goes on to say that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so when someone comes up out of the water, it is symbolic. Please hear what I'm saying. It is symbolic. The water is not doing this. It is the Spirit of God that does this in you. And this has to take place before you get in the water. The water is symbolic. The water is a picture. Okay? 
I like to tell people, I like to, to take, I used to wear a wedding ring until I lost several of them and I don't want to lose my finger, so my wife has given me permission now not to have to mess with it, which is awesome because I hated wearing the stupid thing. But anyway, when I used to wear a wedding ring, I like to take that off and take especially a young person who's ready to get baptized and put it on their finger and say, okay, now does this make you married to Wendy? Well, everybody knows that it doesn't. Well, of course not. But if you believe that that water saves you, that's what you're saying. You're saying that the symbol saves. A wedding ring is a symbol. That wedding ring does not make me married. What made me married? My promise, my word, my, my oath that I made to her. That's what made me married. Okay? Now, everybody that was there that day heard the oath. They saw the promise and the covenant that we made. But then for the rest of my life... They can see the symbol. Can't see it on me because I don't wear it. But the symbol shows, hey, uh, that guy's married. And you, you all do this. You walk in, you look at someone's finger, and you say, yep, she's married. I don't know who he is, but I know she's married. I know there was a, I wasn't at the wedding, but I know she's married, right? Because it's a symbol. Well, that's what the water is. The water is symbolic of what we're reading about here in Romans chapter 6. So we have this identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Secondly, we have a unification. We are united with Christ. Take a look at verse 5. For if we have been planted... Now, like, I'm not trying to be facetious or mean or ugly or, or anything like that. I, I, I firmly and fully believe that this is very important. If I take someone and sprinkle some water on their head... And then I say, you were planted with Christ. That doesn't look like planting. When you plant a seed, you dig a hole, put the seed in it, and cover it up with dirt. When you plant, you know, it's like the old western, old west town undertaker. His sign was said, you plug them, I'll plant them. Right? Well, that's what you do. You, you, you plant a dead body. You take this rotting corpse you dig a hole in the ground, you put it in the ground, you cover it up. And so he says, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Because Christ died, he was buried in the tomb, and on the third day he was raised from the dead. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Okay? Just, like, just, like we, just like we were transported back in time and nailed to the cross with Jesus. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. This is the spiritual reality of salvation. We are no longer a slave of sin. We are now a slave of Christ. And we don't have to serve sin any longer. It says there, <clears throat> For he that is dead is freed from sin. So, so we can see this unification. So it's an identification with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. It is a unification with Jesus where we are united with him so that these things become true of us. We're talking about a spiritual reality. We are talking about something that we cannot see, that we must believe because God's word tells us this is what is happening. And finally, we see an emancipation. An emancipation, that means to be set free. That's what verse 7 says. He that is dead is freed from sin. We are now in a new covenant with Jesus as a result of our faith. When we call on the name of the Lord, we are, our status is changed. We've talked about before that you've got a ledger. And in, in a ledger, if, you, if you've ever studied accounting, you have uh, debits and you have credits. And our ledger is filled with debits. We owe a debt to God because of our sin. And what Christ does is he takes from his infinite supply of merit and he pays off our debt and brings us back to zero. But he does more. Then he credits to our account his infinite supply of righteousness so that we are fully righteous in Christ. Oh, it's, it's so wonderful, you know, uh, as we, we read that, we, or we, we read the words of that song as we sing this morning, you know, my, my sin, not in part, but the whole, 
is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. What a song. What a, what a reality. This is what has happened in our lives. Okay? And so, so we are emancipated when we enter into this new covenant with him. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And we are now emancipated, united, and identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a once-for-all transaction. And baptism is the outward symbol of this inward reality that takes place. All right? Okay, so, so with that, that groundwork laid, if Romans 6 is this wonderful, magnificent uh, reality. This is what happens in the spiritual realm. What is the water for then? Well, the water is the wedding ring. The water is the outward symbol to show principalities and powers, to show our friends and our neighbors, to show the church, to show the world that we are now identified, united, and emancipated in Christ. And we don't care who knows. Matter of fact, we want for the whole world to know. And so baptism is a part of our profession of faith as we make a good confession. All right? So let's take a look. Let's take a survey. We're going to go through the book of Acts and a few other places. But let's turn over to the book of Acts chapter 2. And let's see who then should be baptized. Okay? Acts chapter 2. And let's start reading verse 37. It says there, Acts 37... Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches this message. And he said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, now, this is one of the passages of Scripture where people who believe that baptism actually saves will bring you to, and they say, see, it says right there that you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. So baptism washes your sins away. Problem with that is, is that little word for is the Greek word E-I-S. It's used like thousands of times in the New Testament, and it is a, uh, a uh, it's like an and, but, or, it's a conjunction type word, okay? So it is used in all kinds of different ways. Let me suggest to you in this particular instance that you might read it on account of. So he says, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ on account of the remission of sins. Because you don't ever take a single passage of scripture and retranslate everything else in scripture based on one place. That's not a wise thing to do. That's how crazy doctrines come about. All throughout Scripture, we understand that it's the blood of Christ that takes our sin away. We understand it's our faith in Jesus that, that, for, that in, on, is the basis of which he forgives us. So you are baptized because this has happened to you. Nonetheless, as we look at this, what we see is, is that these people are commanded to repent and then to be baptized. All right? So first of all, baptism is for believers. Now, look at old Morgan back there. Isn't he awesome? He's getting to where he can walk around, and he's throwing the football, and he's he's just, he's doing great. He's precious as the day is long, and he's growing, and it depends on the day, Jennifer says, and, but can he believe yet? Now, be honest. Can Caleb, can Riot, can these, can these little guys, can they, can they believe yet? No. They're not there. They can't understand these things that we're talking about right now. They're just, they're just not there yet. So would it do us any good to sprinkle some water on their head? And the answer is no, it won't do them any good. Now, with that said, there are many. Matter of fact, Millions of people all over the world that are taught 
that the very first thing you need to do when one of these little ones is born is run down there and let somebody sprinkle some water on their head because that water is going to give them forgiveness for original sin. And it's going to keep them from going to a place called limbo when they, if, not when, if something, God forbid, were to happen to one of those little ones before they're old enough to understand things and they're not sprinkled on their head that they will go to a place called limbo. All right? I got, I got 66 books here. I got no limbo. I got no sprinkling. And I got no babies. Okay? So, where did that come from? I don't have any idea, but it's not true. Okay? It, it, it's not true. God bless them. I love them. It's not true. So what happens to an infant when something happens before they're old enough to believe in Christ? Well, that's another message for another day. But let me just say to, to the, the quick answer is instantly heaven. Doesn't matter who they are or where they come from. Okay? I'll prove that to you sometime. But uh, w- w- baptism is for believers, that's why we practice a believer's baptism, okay? So, Acts 2, 37 and 38, Peter tells him you must repent. So, baptism takes place after repentance. There are lots of churches who, when a child reaches a certain age, most of the time it's 12 years old. They have a certain class. They send them to this class. Once they go through this class, they all go get baptized. Is that scriptural? No, no. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not. I can't find it any. I cannot find that practice ever taking place or any instruction whatsoever that that's what we should do. And the problem with that is, is that we're saying when you reach that age, you have now believed and repented. Maybe and maybe not. Some of those children believed and repented when they were five or six years old and have been told they have to wait till they're 12 to be baptized. I can't find that anywhere in Scripture either. I can't find a class associated with this whatsoever. I I, I can't find those things. So, can an infant repent? No. Can an infant believe? No, they can't. They can't. It's funny. um, Once again, I'm not trying to be ugly or mean, and I certainly don't want to pick a fight, but if, if we need to fight over Scripture, that would be what I would fight over. But the Lutheran confession is one of the most absurd things I've ever heard in my life because they actually ask the baby if they believe on Christ. And then by proxy, the parents answer on behalf of the child. I'm sorry, you can't get saved by proxy. Those of you who are children here today, your parents may have been saved and they're saved and they love Jesus and they follow Jesus and you must be saved yourself. You must make a decision for yourself. You can't ride on the coattails of your parents' faith. So there's no proxy. Guess what? Mormons baptize people by proxy for dead people. One of the reasons the Mormon group is so adamant about doing genealogical studies is they are going back in time looking up their dead ancestors and getting baptized for people who are already dead so that somehow by proxy that will get them into some kind of Mormon heaven. Not one word in scripture. Not one word. Actually there is one word about baptism for the dead. It's in 1 Corinthians and it's talking about a heathen practice. Okay. Baptism comes after receiving the word of God. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 8. Fantastic passage of scripture in Acts chapter 8 and verse 30. Uh, we talked about this last week. Uh, Philip is, is told by the Spirit to go off out into the desert and he's got to meet one man out there, this, this Ethiopian fellow. And Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him. The guy's in his chariot. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah. He's got a scroll from the Bible. He's riding along his chariot. His chariot driver's driving the chariot. He's sitting over there, and he's reading the Bible. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, that's Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 
The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Well, that's from Isaiah chapter 53. And he's talking about Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus 750 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so verse 35, now watch what Philip does. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You see, you, this, this Ethiopian eunuch believed in God. He had left Ethiopia, traveled all the way to uh, Jerusalem. He'd been reading his Bible the whole way and he's reading his Bible the whole way home and he's still lost. Because you can't be saved unless you put your faith in Jesus. And so verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now look at the verse, verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So there's his confession. Yes, I believe this to be the truth of Jesus. And verse 38 says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Okay? So they both in the water. You know, it doesn't say, and Philip scooped up a handful of water, sprinkled it upon the Ethiopian's head and said, now thou art baptized. No, because that's not what baptism is. Baptism is not sprinkling. Sprinkling is not baptism. You can't define words however you want to. Baptism means to dip or to dunk or to immerse. So they both went down in the water and they immersed it. We used to baptize in a water trough at the sail barn at Clovis. And uh, we were going to have a baptism one day, and one of our buddies got saved, and he is a big boy. I'm talking knees. He big. He big all over. And uh, <clears throat> he kind of has a, one of those pots. You know, I, I got to roll. I hate it. I got to lose it. But he's got a pot, you know, and it's hard. It just starts right here at his sternum, and it's just, boom, it's, this thing is hard, you know. And... I mean, literally, hard as a rock. And uh, so we had one of those oblong metal wash trough, uh, water troughs. And we're sitting there, you know, the guys are like, hey, let's have this baptism. Okay, let's do it. They said, don't worry about it, preacher. We'll get a water trough. I'm like, I'm thinking something like what we use, you know. And I come in, it's this little sheep trough that's oblong that's about like this size. And I'm like, there's no way we can get him in there. And I said, you know, he's got to go all the way under, Right. So we, we eye him up, you know, and we measure him kind of like measuring you for your casket. And we're like, I think we can get it done, but, you know, you're going to have to bear with us here. And so we come up with this plan that we're going to scoot him all the way to the front, right? This is like an engineering feat. So you get in there, you scoot all the way to the front. Then two of us, one of us on each side, because I can't, you know, I get him down, we can't get back up. And so that would be bad. I've, I've never lost anybody in a baptism yet, but that day could have been that way, you know. And I'm trying to keep him from having to be like a turtle on his back and all that good stuff. And so, so I say, okay, here we go. So we push him all the way to the front. You're going to sit down on your haunches, and then we're going to let you all the way down, get you all the way under. So we, we get him all the way up, all the way back, all the way down. We had to sprinkle his belly because it wouldn't, you know, I mean, just right here with just this round pot sticking out of there, you know, we're like, and we bring him back up, so. Paige Patterson tells this really funny story. Anyway, no, I better not do that. We need to keep moving. Listen, baptism is, and y'all have probably seen the video of the, the man, and he's giving the speech and talking about the little boy, and the little boy, cannonball! And he bails in there, you know, and kaploosh. Have anybody seen that video? I love it. It's hilarious. If anybody around here does it, you're going to get a whooping. But uh, uh, the man, I mean, he just splashed him. He's got his microphone in there. You know, by the way, somebody here in Texas got electrocuted that way, so... You've got to be careful with water and electronics. Anyway, the little boy, you know, when he, everything settles back down, the choir loft is covered with water as it comes splashing out. And the man looks at the little boy and everybody in the congregation. First it's a, <gasps> and then everybody's dying laughing. He says, we will not have that happen again. And, you know, and so, so you know, you, you, you have believed 
you have repented, but we're still dealing with sanctification and sin, right? At this point. And anyway. No, baptism comes after receiving the word of God. This eunuch, he didn't even, Philip didn't, didn't say the first thing we need to do is get you baptized. That man requested baptism after Philip had preached Jesus to him, after he had taken the word of God and explained to him who Jesus was. And that man realized who Jesus was. He requested that Philip baptize him. And Philip made sure you can if you believe with all your heart. By the way, I believe it's verse 37 or 38. But if your version of the Bible does not have that verse in it, you need to get you a new Bible. Because some of them completely skip that. Some of them stick it down in the, you know, well, the oldest and best manuscripts do not contain. Listen, the Greek word for that is baloney. Because this is such an important aspect of baptism. You don't get baptized until you believe. And it won't do us any good. If you got saved by getting wet, we'd own a fire truck. Amen? We would own a fire truck. I'd just drive down these streets like the, like the ice cream guy with my, my music playing. And when kids came running out, I'd just hose them down in the name of Jesus. That, that water doesn't save. Water has never saved. Okay? And so he says, uh, let's, let's turn over to chapter 9 of Acts and verse 17. <clears throat> this is when the apostle Paul received Christ. He met him on the road to Damascus. And in verse 17, it says, and Ananias went his way and he entered into the house and he putting his hands on Paul, Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Okay? So, baptism comes after meeting Jesus. That's who Saul met on the road to Damascus. He, at, at in the middle of the day, this blinding light, knocks them all to the ground and blinds them. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, how do I know who you are, Lord? How can I be persecuting you? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And so, so it, it happened after he met Jesus. Okay, So you've got to have a relationship with Christ. Turn over to Acts chapter 10. This is the story of Peter going to the uh, man Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. It says there, While Peter yet spake, these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So Peter is preaching the word to a group of Gentiles at Cornelius' house. And something like the day of Pentecost happened at that particular time. Now this was important because even Peter was having a hard time believing that these Gentiles could be saved. You see, everybody who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was Jewish. They were all there for a particular feast in Jerusalem. But this is a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit that takes place there amongst Gentiles. And it says in verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So baptism comes after meeting Jesus, after hearing the word of God. And here we see that this is the baptism with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Okay, So when you get saved or born again, a miracle happens. And the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. They got to see this happen in these Gentiles' lives. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist, John the Dipper, John the Dunker said, 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I am, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay? And so the baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that happens inside of you. You can't see it, but the water is symbolic of that. Water baptism symbolizes spirit baptism. When a person is born again, they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Your part is to trust in Christ. God's part is to give Holy Spirit baptism. So, what about infants? Do we baptize infants? There is not one stitch or one... There is zero, zero scriptural evidence of infants being baptized. Never, not one time. Uh, I will send out this week a a video. Uh, The last couple weeks I've sent out some videos on creation that are really good. If you got a chance to watch those, they're awesome. But this week I'll send out a debate that John MacArthur had with R.C. Sproul. And it is the baptism debate. It happened at a shepherd's conference. These guys are friends. They love each other. They don't doubt either one of them that the other one is a believer, but one of them believes in baptizing babies and the other one does not. And I would love for you, if you are interested in this, to watch this because John will do what I have done this morning. The Bible says, 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 the Bible says. And R.C. will say, the Bible doesn't say a word about this, but we believe because of tradition. We believe because of tradition. We do this because of tradition, because of tradition, because of tradition. And that's the short version of it. You can watch the whole thing if you want to. It's fantastic. Because R.C. Sproul is very, I mean, he, and he's not convinced when he gets done that he is wrong. But he's wrong. Why? Because he has departed from Scripture. And he is holding to the traditions of his particular denomination rather than than holding to the word of God. And listen to me, someday you will stand before Almighty God and you will answer for what you have done with this book. You will not answer for your traditions. There are so many traditions that people have made up that have nothing to do with the word of God and infant baptism is one of those. However, with that said, turn with me to the book of Colossians right quick and I will show you something really interesting. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. Speaking of Jesus, it said, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So just as there is a spiritual baptism, there is also a circumcision made without hands. Now what is circumcision? It's an operation performed by Jews on baby boys. At eight days old, the foreskin is removed from a baby boy. It's painful, it's bloody, and it's real. And they were commanded by God to do it, okay? So he says that the real circumcision is one made without hands. In other words, a spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And the very next verse, he says, buried, not sprinkled, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. One of the reasons I believe that many people practice infant baptism is because they have replaced Israel with the church. And Israel's covenant was to take an eight-day-old baby boy and put the sign of the covenant on him. What was the sign of the covenant? Circumcision circumcision was the sign of the covenant. And I believe many in the modern church have decided that the church has replaced Israel. And instead of 
practicing circumcision, they practice infant baptism. And they think that by sprinkling an infant, or even dunking an infant, that they are putting the sign of the covenant on them. The problem is, is the church has not replaced Israel, and we are not commanded to practice baptism in that manner. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, they circumcise baby boys, and in the New Testament, we baptize infants in Christ. Amen? Babes in Christ. New believers get baptized. How old are you? Don't matter. Old enough to believe, old enough to repent, old enough to meet Jesus, old enough to hear the word, old enough to be filled up with the Holy Ghost. How old is that preacher? I don't know. I know some people who about five years old got saved. I have no reason to believe that it wasn't genuine. I know some other people who were saved when they were 65 years old. And they're both a babe in Christ. And the very next thing that both of them should do is be baptized in water. That's what they should do as a sign of the covenant. So, next question. Does baptism save? The Bible is very clear. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Very next verse. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism, water baptism, is a work that you submit yourself willingly to. It is something that you do. Therefore, it cannot be something that saves you. It is a sign of the salvation that you have through faith in Christ. Romans 5 verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So it's not water that saves, it's blood that saves. Okay, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So make no mistake about it. Paul said, I believe in the gospel because that's how people get saved. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, I become all things to all men that I by all means might save some. Okay? So Romans says it's the preaching of the gospel that saves. Paul said, I'm all about saving people. I'm willing to do away with my rights to be able to save somebody. Okay? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Paul is very upset with the sectarian uh, church because, you know, they all had their, you know, I like Roddy. Well, I don't like Roddy. I like John MacArthur. Well, I don't like John MacArthur. I like, you know, I like, I don't know. I don't even know. I can't even. Adrian Rogers. I like Adrian. Well, I, and then there were the really spiritual ones that said, well, I just listen to Christ. I don't listen to any of them, you know. So, so you got all this, this going on. That's what he's dealing with here. Verse 13. He says, is Christ divided? Well, the answer is no, of course not. Was Paul crucified for you? Well, no. By the way, neither was Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or Schofield or any other hero that you have. Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Absolutely not. Nobody's been baptized in the name of Paul. Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you. What a verse. But Crispus and Gaius. So Paul was there and he says, you know, I, I'm really glad that I didn't baptize any of you because then you might be saying that since I baptized you that you're a follower of me. Oh, oh, yeah, I, I baptized Crispus and Gaius. I baptized those two guys. Did Paul carry around that list of people he had baptized? Did he have the notches in his Bible of all the baptisms he had done? Apparently not. Verse 15, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized, oh, he, second, oh yeah, by the way, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now listen, Paul said, I do everything I can to save some in 1 Corinthians 9. In Romans 1 16, I believe in the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. The apostle Paul risked his life to get people saved. And yet he said, I'm really glad I didn't baptize most of you. If Paul believed that baptism saved, 
he would have known exactly who he baptized, and he would have baptized every single one of them if that's what it took to be saved. Look at the next verse, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What a verse! God just answers 2,000 years of foolishness right there. Here's the gospel, here's baptism. These are not the same and they are not tied together. Baptism is a part of sanctification, is an act of obedience. It is important. It is very important. But it is not salvation. Salvation is over here. Preaching the gospel comes through. That's where salvation comes from, is through preaching the gospel. Look at that. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. How do you get saved? The preaching of the cross. That's how you get saved. So then what difference does baptism make? If, if it's not salvation, why? Well, let's go to Jesus. And we're going to close with this. Jesus was baptized. Now think about it with me. These people are coming to John the Baptist. They're all Jews. And they're coming down to the river and he's baptizing them in the river. And he's baptizing them for the repentance of of sins and he won't baptize the scribes and pharisees he calls them a brood of vipers he says he says you need to repent well they won't repent they don't think they've done anything wrong but the people the normal people they are looking for the messiah to come and they are flocking to john and he's baptizing them why because jews baptize proselytes baptism is much older than the church what's a proselyte that Ethiopian eunuch, he's a proselyte. He had probably already been baptized. It doesn't say, but he probably had because this is what Jews did. So if you're not a Jew, let's say you're from Ethiopia, but you want to worship the God of the Jews. In their day, in the first century, what did you do? You came, you presented yourself at a synagogue. You had to sit on a different side. Men over here, women over here, Gentiles in the back. So when it was over, you went up to one of the men. You said, look, I want to be a proselyte. I want to become a Jew. I said, well, you can do that, but it's going to take some things. First of all, you've got to renounce all your, you know, no ham and cheese sandwiches, no more catfish, right? You're going to have to adhere to the law of Moses. You're going to have to be circumcised, no lying. So somehow they had to prove that. Ah, thank God we don't live in that day. But anyway, that, that's, they would have had to, the men would have had to have submit to circumcision and they would have been baptized as a symbol that they were washing off that old filthy, nasty Gentile stuff. And they were coming up a new person, a new Jew, right? So isn't that interesting? That, that, that Ethiopian eunuch was reading the Bible on his way to worship God, the true God in Jerusalem. And he'd probably been baptized and he's still lost because you have to believe in Jesus to be saved, okay? So when Jesus shows up, we can read about this in Matthew chapter 3, uh, Mark, Luke. They all talk about the baptism of Jesus. Why would Jesus be baptized? Does Jesus have any sin? Well, 1 Peter 2.22 says, who did, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So that answers that for us. So then why was Jesus baptized? Let's read about it. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. He's a Jew. He doesn't need to be. He's not a proselyte. Well, at least he's half Jewish, right? On his mother's side. Okay. And, and he comes to John to be baptized of him. Now watch John's reaction. But John forbade him. There were two groups of people that John forbade to be baptized. One, the Pharisees. You people need to repent. I'll not baptize you. Who's the other one? Jesus. You don't need to repent. I can't baptize you. Isn't that great? John knew what this was all about. John is offended. He's like, absolutely not. He forbade him. <laughs> you know, Peter's the only other one I could find in Scripture that did something so foolish as, Jesus, hush your mouth. I can't believe you're saying that, right? He forbade No. I'm not going to baptize you, saying I have need to be baptized of thee. See, John knew exactly who Jesus was. He was the sinless one. Why would you be baptized? You're sinless. You don't, have, you don't have anything to repent of. 
And you come that, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Watch what he says. This is very important. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Everything that he did pleased the Father. Why was Jesus baptized? Because the Father said to. That's why. That's why. Was Jesus a sinner? Absolutely not. Did he need to repent? Of course not. Nothing to repent of. But it was done to fulfill all righteousness. It was done to to begin his ministry. Because what's going to happen? It says, Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Not a dove lighting on him, but the Spirit of God like a dove. They saw bodily, they saw the Spirit come like a dove, very gradually, very gracefully, and descend upon Jesus in a visible way. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is Jesus' coronation. This is his confirmation. This is his beginning of his ministry. From this point in time on, he begins his public outward ministry that people can see the things that he's doing. It had nothing to do with sin. It had everything to do with righteousness. And I submit to you, this is what we would say. We would use this kind of language. We would say that baptism is the first act of obedience for a new believer. Suffer it now because this is what it requires for all righteousness. The very first thing, the very first work that you should do when you get saved is to be baptized. You should, you should do this. An unbaptized Christian is an oxymoron. Are they lost? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You're saved if you put your faith in Christ. But a Christian who won't submit to baptism doesn't make any sense at all. It, it's, it's, it's so out of place that, that there's not even a category for it. Because even the Son of God himself submitted himself to baptism by John. And it had nothing to do with him repenting. It had everything to do with doing what the Father wanted him to do. So, this is my invitation to you. Number one, are you saved? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have, do you have a relationship with Him? I'm not talking about ritual. I'm not talking about baptisms, catechisms. I think we probably have dealt with all those kind of things. Circumcision. I don't care. Don't want to know. What I'm talking about is, is in your heart, have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in Him? Number two, have you followed Him in a believer's baptism by immersion? Have you done that? If you haven't done that, let me just encourage you. You need to do that. It, it's important. It is, it is an outward symbol of an inward reality in your life. Matthew chapter 28, verses 28 to 30. Jesus says, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to uh, obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is what we are supposed to do as a church, is to make disciples and baptize them. And so, so if, if you haven't. Now, should you, should you do this? Let, let me answer one more question. I got, I'm, I'm a minute over, but, but this is a question that I've been asked ever since I began. What if I got baptized when I was a kid? But I know that I wasn't saved when I got baptized. I didn't get saved until later. Should I be rebaptized? Yes, absolutely. Stop worrying about it. Stop arguing about it. Stop thinking about it. Answer the question and go do it. What if I, in order to join a church at some point in time, they wanted me to be baptized. And I had never been baptized before that, but I wasn't real sure. But I did it because my husband wanted me to join. My wife wanted me to do it. My girlfriend wanted me to do it. I did, and I did it for the wrong reasons. But now I know where I stand. Should I be baptized? Yes, do it. Don't, don't put it off any longer. What if I was sprinkled as a baby, but I never have been dunked in water, but I believe in Jesus? Yes, you should be baptized. Absolutely, you should. What if I... 
Look, you get saved, you follow in baptism. What if I believed when I was younger, and I know I believed in Christ, and I got baptized, but since then I've strayed away from the Lord. Do I need to be rebaptized? No. You need to confess. You need to ask for God's forgiveness. You need to get your heart right with God, receive His forgiveness, and you need to, to put your eyes back on Jesus where they need to be and, and keep following Him. Um, you know, rebaptism would only be because you weren't saved when you got baptized or you weren't scripturally baptized, i.e., you got sprinkled or had water poured on you or, you know, whatever, something like that. I hope this answers some questions. Uh, please don't go home and fight with your family over this. It, it's, it's probably not worth it anyway. Just send them a link to my video. I'll post it on YouTube and Facebook, and, and then they can, they can get mad at me. Um, but but here's, here's my plea to you, and I hope this is what I've done this morning. We don't believe this because of tradition. We believe this because this is what the Word of God says. And, and that's why we think mode and the fact that you're a believer when you do get baptized is so important, okay? Father, thank you for this day and thank you for the Word of God. Lord, we are so grateful for the Word. Thank you that you haven't left us without a witness. And thank you, Lord, that you haven't left us as orphans. Your Spirit, you've given your Spirit to us. God, if there's somebody here this morning and they've never received your son into their life, they've never been born again, I pray, Lord, that today would be their day of salvation, that they would call on the name of Jesus, confess their sin, and, and, and repent and trust in his shed blood on the cross and receive Christ today. And Father, I pray that your word answers some questions for us all, that we might understand what baptism is and why it's important for the believer. Lord, we just give you this time now. We ask you to just work in all of our hearts and speak to us as individuals. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.